The situation in South Sudan as it is as we speak right now is particularly very concerning. We have 1.7 million people who are externally displaced as refugees. We have 1.9 people displaced from their homes, people that have left their homes from the, when the conflict started in December 2013. So nobody's talking about this. Why is nobody talking about this? There are instances where South Sudan has been discussed in the media, but given the gravity of the situation itself, you know, the experiences that civilians in the country are going through, it is a surprise that we do not see South Sudan in the media or that people do not discuss the situation as, as well as it should be discussed. But discussing the situation is one thing and having discussions that lend to, to uh, an end to the conflict is another. So what do you want fellow Africans to know? What do you want the world to know today? I mean, the conflict in South Sudan today is a result of not only a, a myriad of issues, a lack of political leadership is one of them. And this lack of political leadership is also evident within the region. You know, um, and it is important to have solidarity across Africa for this conflict in South Sudan. This agreement has not brought an end to the conflict. It has not brought an end to the, you know, to the corruption. It has not brought an end to the suffering that South Sudanese are going through. So it is important that there is collective support from all this, you know, from all these institutions and, and areas of governance and areas of business to ensure that South Sudanese leaders at the end of the day can account for the human cost, for the for the financial cost, for you know the cost of the conflict in South Sudan itself. It's been decades. I remember in the early 1990s working on the lost boys moving down from South Sudan. And for me, in many ways, it seems unbelievable that decades later, South Sudan is still in crisis. And the question I would then ask you is, as a young South Sudanese, do you feel that Africa and the world has abandoned a cause that we should be focusing on? It's been a merging of conflicts going back. Um, certainly when I sit here, I think about our futures that are being jeopardized, our futures that are being lost and stolen from us and being plundered. And so there are, there are instances where you feel that yes, Africa has our back or that there are people that care about the situation in South Sudan. But when it comes to the political level, that is lacking. When I was in Gambia a few months ago, a taxi driver was asking me, how is the situation in your country? So certainly people resonate, people hear about it, you know, but people do not understand it. And the continental support, especially at the African Union level, at EGAD level, it feels that it has collapsed since the peace agreement was signed in August 2015. Some of the very simple questions. Is it possible to have an absolute ceasefire in South Sudan today? We have to ask ourselves, do South Sudanese lives matter? And if they matter, why are we not putting our feet down for the children, for the men and women of South Sudan, for that society? What can be done? What must we do? Let's do it. Final words final words to those who could make a difference, what would you say? Let's all take action to make, to remind every single South Sudanese, you know, that their lives matter. This is a two-part special series on South Sudan. You can use the hashtag Talk South Sudan on social media. The situation is dire. There is strife. There is also famine and possible economic collapse. And the question we're asking is how can we play a role in transforming the situation? You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues and I am Julie Gishuru.
We are very honored to have stakeholders present with us to engage in this conversation. We thank you all for making time to be here. We are also honored to have an incredible panel. And to introduce the panel, let me just get started. Peter Biar Ajak, Senior Advisor at the International Growth Center. He's also a fellow of the Archbishop Tutu Leadership Program and has been doing incredible things in this space already. Thank you so much, Peter, for making time to be with us. Also with us, Nyagwa Tut, South Sudan campaigner and Sudan campaigner as well, right? <laughs> with Amnesty International. Thank you so much. You are the one in the interview. We have already spoken about this and you also have been at the forefront of fighting for peace and for transformation in South Sudan. Thank you for being here. Also with us, ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon, we have Ali Verji, who is the former Acting Chief of Staff, Joint Monitoring and Evaluation Commission, and former political advisor to the EGAD Mediation for South Sudan, such an incredible voice who has been part of the process, was part of the process for a period of time. He's also a fellow of the Rift Valley Institute. Please, let's give them a round of applause for making time to be with us. And so we're going to get started, I think, where we left off on that video, really looking at what needs to be done. And we will ask, has leadership done enough? Has citizenry done enough? But first of all, what's the current state of play? Please, uh, Peter, share with us on the ground what is happening. The civil war in the South Sudan is still going on. In fact, over the last uh, few months, the conflict has been raging uh, virtually in everywhere in the country, from western side, within the equatorial region, in Upper Nile, in many parts. Uh, and you are seeing fragmentations uh, going on with, uh, within the government and also within the opposition. Uh, so now the number of actors has become very many. So civil war is going on, has made it difficult for humanitarian access to reach people, has made it difficult for trades and goods to move uh, within the country. Second, you have famine that is going on. Uh, famine is declared officially uh, in three counties in uh, Unity State, uh, in northern southern Sudan. Uh, but if you really look at the conditions in virtually uh, most of the states, uh, it's very bad. And uh, it could reach that level of famine if the situation continues. Then third uh, problem that is going on, there is an uh, epidemic. There is epidemic of cholera, uh, which is taking place in many parts in South Sudan, uh, partly also fueled by conflict and also the, uh, the situation of humanitarian crisis, uh, but also lack of access to, to water, uh, people are being displaced from their home. So if you look at the current statistics where things are going, uh, the projection is that by the end of the year, half of South Sudanese population would have either starved to death or flee the country. I mean, certainly I'd wish to offer a more positive outlook other than what Peter has already said. But when you look at one thing that comes out from the conflict since it started in December 2013 is the fact that both sides to the conflict, the government the, and the opposition and other allied militias have committed violations of human rights across the board. They have targeted civilians on basis of ethnicity or alleged political affiliation. Um, they have killed civilians in churches, in mosques, um, in, places, you know, in places of refuge, even within the unmissed peacekeeping sites. Um, civilians have been shot while they are running. Women and girls have been sexually assaulted. Some have been abducted and subjected to sexual and gender-based violence and even sexual slavery. Um, and... You know, amidst all this, there's also both sides to the conflict, the government and the opposition also blocking humanitarian access from reaching the people because it's not every single individual that can make it to a UN mission base in the country. Others have to flee to the bushes, to the swamps, um, to other areas where they're hosted by communities. But given that the country in the last three years, people have been running back and forth and have not had the time to cultivate or settle down. There's the dire need for, you know, the food situation is critical, yet there is no humanitarian access being able to reach people. The OHCHR released a, a public statement asking the government to, so, to stop the offensive they're launching in Upper Nile because there are civilians stuck in an area called Abu Roch and he says about 500,000 people are at risk of mass atrocities. 
You know, Ali, listening to those figures, the question we have to ask is, do we have institutions in Africa that are working? And EGAT is an institution that has a key role to play here. All the neighboring uh, countries have a role to play. The African Union has a role to play. You know, we've heard the UN, Guterres has spoken on this issue and said, you know, this really needs to stop. We need to address it. But why has there just been a failure to implement even what's been agreed upon so far? What's, what's the problem? Julie, South Sudan is not an island. As you said, the IGAD, AU, the region, the continent all has a responsibility. There's all sorts of connections. But the failure of the current process is, is basically a failure of, of leadership. And it is a failure of leadership, not only in terms of a vision for South Sudan, but also a vision for uh, greater prosperity and greater stability in the region as a whole. It's not that South Sudan would ever be a perfect country. There will be many challenges for many years to come. But ultimately, the leaders that are presently in place have not demonstrated the courage to move forward to address the problems that are uh, prevalent in the society. Well, I think, I think the answer does come from South Sudanese. No external party, no external organization can be the one to solve the problem. But that doesn't mean there isn't a role to play. That doesn't mean there isn't solidarity that needs to be demonstrated by the region, by the continent and by the world. Okay, so Peter, I've, I've heard this a lot from fellow media personalities who've engaged in the South Sudan situation. Um, I, I mean, it's, ultimately, it has to come from the people of South Sudan. And so let me come to you with this question now. What do you expect today from the leadership in South Sudan? What do you expect today from external leaders? For me... I think the crisis in South Sudan uh, for the time period that it has run uh, offer an opportunity for leadership. And as uh, Ali just mentioned, this opportunity has been wasted over and over again. We have been looking at the leadership of the SPLM, the leadership of the country, looking at the principals who have been fighting the war, mainly struggling over power to show this leadership. They have not showed this leadership. Uh, now in Juba, uh, people are talking whether the agreement is being implemented. People are talking about if the agreement is being monitored. But what is interesting thing is they're also talking about who should initiate the ceasefire. So if you, are, if you don't have a ceasefire and people are fighting, it's difficult then to say that you have a peace in the country. I think where the crisis has reached now, one of the first things that need to be acknowledged by the leadership of South Sudan is that we cannot pretend that things are going well. We cannot pretend that there's agreement that is on track and that is being implemented. This will be lying to ourselves, and it will be putting the, 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 the future of our country at jeopardy. As I mentioned to you before, if you look at all the major crises that could befall a country, from war, famine, epidemics, there's nothing that is missing in South Sudan. One thing I didn't mention is that the economy has virtually collapsed. It's not that there is a possibility of economic collapse, it's that there is economic collapse. I also want to emphasize that even within the country right now, one thing that we forget to mention is that there is an existing Orwellian-like crackdown on freedom of expression and freedom of speech. And even within this crackdown, there are very brave people within civil society, within women groups, within youth forums, you know, people like Anna Taban, who are, you know, taking an extra step to come out and, you know, lead from a different forum, say, this is what we want. We want, we want change in this country. And the way we want to achieve this change is have you know, is have citizen-driven dialogue, is to have representation. In December 2013, when the conflict broke out, w one of the first acts of solidarity that the region did, they sprung up to action. And the Peace and Security Council established, um, established the African U Union Commission of Inquiry on South Sudan. The report of this commission was released uh, in, um, uh, in September 2015. And one of the issues it, re it recommended was the establishment of a hybrid court. Because what was recognized was that there is impunity across the board, um, not only for the conflict that started in 2013, but for other conflicts. And how do we address that? But by ensuring accountability. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. You know, Ali, I, I come to you now and, and you emphasize to us the importance of the people of South Sudan really driving uh, the process. And, and that is recognized and understood. 
But what should we expect from, and, and first I want to start with African leadership. What should we expect from African leadership right now? What role should they be playing to ensure that even the plans that have been put in place, the processes that exist, at the very least are implemented? I think, Julie, there's a feeling that there was a lot of effort put, invested in the current process, and that resulted in an agreement, and then the South Sudanese did not uh, implement it, and the responsibility should lie with them. But of course, that obscures the reality that leadership is not about a single action. It's about a continuous engagement set of processes, and that requires leadership by the region as well. So the agreement, even if it had succeeded, was only a short-term solution. It had a very short time frame, and South Sudan would have needed solidarity in any case, even if implementation had been very good. Obviously, it hasn't been very good, and so that means there's a renewed requirement, a renewed need for greater effort, because crisis does not stop at the borders. It's not only about the flow of people across borders, it's also about about the loss of potential for the region, the loss of uh, ability, another lost generation of South Sudanese growing up outside their country or displaced within it. I want to engage now, and we'll come back to the panel in a moment, but I do want to come to the floor and get a sense of how you feel uh, about this situation. And, and you know, I, I will call on some specific people who are working on several different areas of advocacy, but first, I just want to get a sense. Do we feel that African leaders have done enough. If you feel they have, please put your hand up. If you feel they haven't, please put your, keep your hand down. Let's just see. Not one hand has gone up. Not one hand has gone up. Can someone speak to the role they feel African leadership should be playing to support South Sudan today? Is there anybody who wants to speak to that? Thank you very much, sir. My name is Michael Walia. I'm so Sudanese. Let me come to the topic. Why it is important African leadership are requested to put a very essential attention to South Sudan crisis because South Sudan is very young. From the beginning, when we attain our independence, they were our elders. They were helping us in so many ways for us to get independent. And the world was putting much attention on South Sudan to get their independence. And after we get our independence, it seems everybody was washing his hand or her hand from South Sudan. Like we have get whatever is enough for us to get. No, that's not the right thing. They would have to still continue to monitor and see how are we govern ourselves. The reality is this, there is a problem in South Sudan, and who is going to address it if Africa fail? Can we look for the alternative now rather than later? Thank you very much. What a powerful statement. There is a problem in, in South Sudan. Who's going to address it if the Africans fail? The appeal was that when we took South Sudan, when we saw South Sudan there with independence, we should not have walked away or we should not have taken sides. We should have simply let a young country or helped a young country to grow. Bishop Moses Dengbol. Almost half of the people are moving away from the country. And more of those are displaced, either within the UN camp or within the churches. And then so many people are dying on a daily basis. This is the history of South Sudan. And then we have the constitutional crisis coming ahead of us that could even fuel more conflict in 2018. What are you thinking about your country that you have struggled for for so long, that you have suffered for so long? Is that the South Sudan you wanted to see? I am sure with those questions by their colleagues from the region, they will be able to find a solution. Uh, Julia, we are doing uh, quite a good uh, work. At the moment, as I speak to you, most of the churches are full. In fact, as I talked to you, it is only yesterday that the government forcefully removed IDPs, over 5,000 IDPs from my church compound. And they came there, they were sleeping there. I come out in the morning of a night, I actually step over people. And of course, these people are from 
ten tribes of South Sudan. When they came first, they were kind of did not want to see one another in the same compound. But after some time sitting with them, discussing with them, sorting out some issues, they became friends. I could, if I had time, I could give you examples of how I now have a very serious hope that South Sudanese can live together as friends based on that. So the church is hosting people and is even providing some food for the needy and building peace. What we need is more support from our friends around the world, which is already being done, and we need more support even from the international community. Thank you. Peace building, reconciliation and healing is one of the really arduous tasks that has to take place. And so we thank you and recognize your role that you're playing already. And Gordon Lam, where are you? In a moment, I will come to you um, to tell us more about peace building. But first, the gentleman here had his hand up. Please do come forward. Thank you here, if you may. Uh, thanks, uh, Julie, for hosting us. Uh, my name is James Orema. I'm a member of IO. The question which you ask about the African leaders, have they left Southern Sudan? If you saw it, many people did not even raise their hand. It's true. We have been left on our own to sort it. Some of us, all our life, we have grown out as refugees. We have sacrificed all for that country. Today, we have been left alone because of interest. The region have got interest in what is happening in South Sudan. Some of them are even fueling it. We have seen in the history of Africa, here in Kenya, you can't resolve problem by isolation. Kenyatta, the British tried it. They isolated Kenyatta Senior in South Africa. Mandela was isolated, but he didn't solve any problem. You can only solve problem in a country by bringing leaders together, provide an opportunity for people to engage themselves. Thank you so much for that. I, 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 you know, I, from there, I want to go to peace building. Gordon, really, uh, please do stand up and share with us um, on the ground right now. What are the challenges you're facing and, and is there hope? What's the way forward? Um, of course, the dynamic of conflict keeps changing and mostly it affects uh, children, women and elderly because um, the, the, the fighters do not despair and do not respect properties and, 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 and civilian um, properties. This has affected the social fabric of the communities. Um, there's, there's wide raping, there's a wide range of killing, forced disappearance, and destruction of, of properties and looting. Now, if you look carefully, um, the situation is completely growing from bad to worse. And, and, and the attention of the regional leaders is not actually uh, helping South Sudan. They don't put much attention because um, it seems most of the speakers put it earlier that the African leaders seem to be looking at South Sudan as an isolated entity. But if you look carefully, South Sudan was uh, born as a result of advocacy from the region. Um, this is the reality, and it is actually, um, there's no much attention given to South Sudanese to resolve their own conflict. On the situation of the peace building, um, we work with a lot of communities that are displaced, who, who experience social uh, violence, sexual violence, and the question that they raised was, how can we food, uh, how can we bring perpetrators to account? And what will be the effect of the people that are raped, that their property being destroyed all the time. The question of the justice and accountability is number one, all the time from the mind of the, of the civilian that experience sexual violence and killing. So um, the issue of implementation of the uh, 2015 peace agreement 
is being uh, heard out all the time because you can only resolve conflict if you implement the peace uh, agreement. And the country that is going through war, attacks, a bomb all the time, civilians do not have choice and they have to seek uh, protection from the UN uh, peacekeeping. So that's the current reality which is taking place. But I mean, the question is, will there be peace that generate uh, justice, that bring justice and accountability? Will there be peace that will rehabilitate the life of the victim? Will there be peace that will actually reconcile dispute among the communities? Thank you. It's been a fantastic conversation. It's been a sobering conversation here. And I want to end with these words. Next week, of course, we bring you part two of the conversation. We'll be looking at refugees, the impact on women, and so much more. We'll also be looking at the vision for South Sudan. What kind of South Sudan do we want? What kind of South Sudan do the people of South Sudan ultimately want for themselves? That's coming up. As always, we end Africa Leadership Dialogues with an African proverb or an African saying or a quote. I just want to end with an African word. Ubuntu. You are because I am. We are. How do we work together to deliver a peaceful South Sudan? Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.